these lectures will be about microstructural. They're really based on this book a couple of years ago. And the main intention here was to really provide a practical guide. So this is students who are the people doing the experiments. And so really it's very much focused on um, what to do and particularly what not to do in carrying out microstructural characterization. So I really strongly advise you to look in this book because there's much, much more there than I can possibly cover in these short lectures today. And also we have another course which covers only the social characterization, but also lots of um, aspects of cement chemistry. And uh, you may also be interested to follow this uh, from EPFL. So microstructural characterization, I will have uh, four parts in this. Uh, in this first part, we will ha make an overview of what we're trying to do, talk about continuous methods, sample preparation, and X-ray diffraction. In the second part, I'll talk about electron microscopy. In the third part, porosity. And the fourth part, which is very short, will be a case study to show how we can bring all these techniques together uh, to look at phase assemblages in cement paste. So what are we trying to do? Well, the idea is that what is happening in cements and concrete is you have this hydration reaction. And during this hydration reaction, the water reacts with the cement to give you hydrates. So in the simple case of uh, just C3S or a light, this would be the uh, anhydrous phase uh, reacting here and the hydrates forming uh, calcium hydroxide and CSH. In the more complicated case where we have cement, we have all the different phases in cement and then we have some other hydrate phases. And if you want to know more about these different hydrate phases, then um, I advise you to look at the other course I mentioned earlier. They are all described in quite a lot of detail. During the reaction, in fact, we have an overall decrease in volume. That's to say the volume of the water plus the unreacted material is slightly larger than that of the uh, hydrates that form. And for that reason, if we have a sealed system, then we will also form uh, voids, which are also pores. And this hydration reaction can really go on for many years, although it's probably like 80% complete within the first 28 days. So that's the hydration reaction, where what we're interested in is the phase content and distribution, uh, how the phase is formed, the kinetics, etc. And then also microstructural characterization can be used for uh, looking at durability aspects. How is the microstructure affected by the environment? What are the mechanisms responsible for degradation? So in terms of characterization methods, we can take it in three parts. We can first of all have methods that follow the overall reaction, which I call continuous methods. Then we have methods we can use to look at the solid phases. X-ray diffraction, thermal analysis, and scanning electron microscopy are the most common. Uh, unfortunately, we only have time to talk about X-ray diffraction and scanning electron microscopy here. And then lastly, we have techniques to look at the pore structure. Now, before going into the methods in more detail, a few general remarks. And first and foremost, you have to be aware that there's no such thing as a perfect measurement, not even in uh, the most theoretical physics or the most practical physics can you have absolutely accurate measurements. Every measurement has an intrinsic error, and you have to be aware of these. And for most techniques, the relative error increases as the absolute amount decreases. So for example, in the early age, it will be quite difficult to quantify the very small amounts of hydrates that form. Later on, as you get larger amounts, then the quantification becomes more accurate. The second thing is to consider whether we want to look at paste or concrete. Now, of course, concrete is the material we use in the real world, but the changes that are taking place are generally going on in the paste phase. And the problem we have that if we are looking in a concrete, then we can have about 60 to 70% of aggregate, and that's just a diluting effect. 
So we already have this challenge of trying to determine uh, small amounts of phases. If we then only have uh, dilute that by three or three times or so, then of course we make the situation worst. So generally for microstructural characterization, we tend to focus on pace samples, but we have to be careful that um, we can make the paste in the same way, way that it's going to be similar to what you have in a concrete. And there the mixing is especially important, as I'll say later. And one of the main advantages of the microscopy techniques is really we can focus on the paste regions. And lastly, as we'll see in the case study, then really you really need to use several methods in combination. Um, you can use one method to check uh, the validity of another method. So continuous methods we're going to look at very very briefly. Um, there are many details uh, where you need to be careful in terms of experimentation and for those I refer you to the book. So perhaps the foremost technique for following the hydration reaction is isothermal calorimetry and isothermal calorimetry looks at the heat evolution from a hydrating sample. And this heat evolution is a signature of the reactions going on. So the higher the heat evolution, the more reaction we have going on. And here we see the curve which is typical for Portland cements. We see at the beginning we have this very high rate of heat evolution. Then this falls away uh, quickly and remains at a low level for several hours. And that's very important from a practical point of view because this gives you the time to mix your concrete, to move it to the site and to put it in the forms. And then after two or three hours, the rate of heat evolution starts to increase again to a maximum at about 10 hours uh, and then it decreases. So this is a very powerful technique to follow the overall hydration, particularly for the first day or so. Just a few um, points which are important. First of all, that this calorimetry condition uh, is really equivalent to a sealed sample, generally if you're not adding uh, any water. And if you have a very low water cement ratio, then this can make quite an important difference. So we he see here the curve for uh, the paste at 0.3 with no added water. And after only one or two days, the hydration is slowing down. Whereas if we put a small amount of water on top of that sample, then uh, you can see the hydration is going forward um, more, more strongly. By the time we get to a water cement ratio of 0.4, then you can see this uh, extra amount of water does not really make much difference. Very generally, and as I say, you need to look at other things to see the more details, we have the superposition of the alight reaction and the illuminate reaction in the first day. Uh, this big broad peak here is the alight reaction, and then we may have peaks on the uh, decelerating part of the curve due to the different reactions of the illuminate phase. And it's very important that um, from the point of view of having a proper addition of sulfate in the material, that those uh, illuminate peaks occur after the main silicate peak. Second technique we have to uh, look at continuous changes is chem what's called chemical shrinkage, and this measures the volume changes. So if we look at the stoichiometry of the reaction of C3S, for example, as we see here, we can see that uh, one volume of C3S reacts with 1.32 volumes of water. And then this produces 1.57 volumes of CSH and 1.59 of calcium hydroxide. So we see the total solid volume, that's to say this part plus this part, is now roughly double the original solid volume we had at the beginning. However, if we compare the totals on both sides, these two figures here, we see that we have a small uh, decrease in volume of about roughly 7%. And depending on the different anhydrous material, that decrease in volume will be in the range from 5 to 10%. Now, this is a very useful thing because it gives us a very, very simple method by which we can uh, follow the hydration in this chemical shrinkage measurement.
So here we see the setup we have uh, built at EPFL. It's really very simple and can be done really cheaply because the only uh, equipment that's really uh, of any consequence is this water bath, and even that's quite cheap. Then you have, um, in this water bath, you have these small samples. You put a little bit of cement paste at the bottom of your sample. You fill it up with water, and then the water goes up continuously, and at the top you have this oil drop. And this oil drop presents evaporation, and the fact that you have some colorant in this oil drop gives you a means to follow the reaction uh, by this simple webcam here. So here we see the oil drops. These will move over time, and these can then be uh, detected by the webcam and analyzed automatically. If you don't have a webcam, then you can have a student who comes in and measures the position of the drop at regular intervals, but that's um, not quite so convenient. Now, in this experiment, the main aspect to look at is the thickness of the sample. Because if the sample is too thick here, then the water cannot continuously penetrate all the pores in the sample. And of course, again, this becomes more important as we go to lower water cement ratios. So here we see a very low water cement ratio, 0.3. And clearly, this thick specimen at 20 millimeters, you can see after only again about one day, water is not really penetrating the sample. And we have to go down to very thin layer um, to really get continuous hydration. Now, the problem with having a thin layer is then you have a higher error. Now, when you go back to a water cement ratio of 0.4, then it's quite reasonable to have a layer in the range to 5 to 10 millimeters. This is roughly uh, the level you want. So those two are the continuous methods. Now, when we look at discrete methods, discrete means that we have to make a sample, and then at individual times, we have to stop the hydration and do the complete analysis. And here, uh, sample preparation is very important. There's a whole chapter on this uh, in the book. And I'd like to thank uh, the, some of the authors of the book who helped prepare these slides in this part here. Now, what you really have to be aware about is, of course, the shelf life of cement. You can have prehydration of cement. And this may start already as soon as you ground the cement. In, in typical conditions, the shelf life will be only about 6 to 12 months. And in hot, humid conditions, such as you have here in Chennai, it will probably be a quite a lot shorter than that. And this can have quite a dramatic effect on the hydration. So here on the uh, right, we see a thermogravimetric analysis. And you can see in this region here how water has been absorbed by the cement paste, particularly by the illuminate phases. And we have a small formation already of ettringite. So this shows you the aging. And then here on the left, we can see the dramatic effect this will have on the reaction kinetics, that you can see the heat evolution here in the aged sample is really very much reduced compared to the fresh sample. So you have to be very careful about this and plan your experiments to hopefully try and mix everything at the same time so you have the similar sample. If you store your sample carefully, so not in bags like this, and really the recommendation is do not buy your cement in a shop. Really get it direct from the manufacturer. Uh, a rather funny story, we have a collaboration uh, with colleagues in the Department of Physics at the University of Surrey. So, you know, very um, good scientists. But uh, one day they said, oh, we have these very funny results, and when we explored what was the situation, we worked out that they'd just gone to the local shop and bought a bag of cement, which had maybe been lying around in the shop for, you know, who knows how long. So be very careful about this. When you do get your cement, what you want to do is to break it up into smaller batches and put each of these smaller batches in sealed uh, containers. A plastic bucket is quite good and store these under low relative humidity conditions. If you take those precautions, you can see here uh, that the setting time was monitored for this cement during eight years. And for four years, it's really not too bad. And that's typically the length of a PhD study. So do be careful with your cement.
as soon as you get it, put, break it up into smaller batches, work from one container at a time, and try to minimize the amount of times you're opening and closing the container. Then for mixing, uh, this shows a typical kind of mortar mixer or a vacuum mixer. Now, as I've said, for microstructural characterization, we really want to look more at pace. And for pace, we have very important that you really use a kind of high shear mixing with some kind of impeller which will impart shear to the pace, such as down here, to simulate the conditions in the mortar. And in this slide, we can see how dramatic that effect is. But this is the hand mix uh, sample here. And then when we go to a situation which is more like the uh, curing we have in mortar, then we very much accelerate the hydration reactions. So if you're not doing that, then you really will get a false idea of the hydration kinetics. Cast paste, this is the kind of typical method you can use. You can either make individual samples in small containers like this and store them in sealed conditions, or you, and then at individual times, you take these slices, and each of these slices can be analyzed uh, by the methods we're going to talk about later. If you want to simulate water curing, then what we recommend is you have a small container like this. After 24 hours, you take the sample out of the container and then put in another container, which is just a little bit bigger. So the amount of water you have is really very small amount and will minimize the amount of leaching you have from your sample. Don't store your samples in calcium hydroxide solution, which is what many people recommend in the literature, because it's not really calcium that's leaching out, it's actually the alkalis that leach out. And if you al leach out the alkalis, you'll very much change the reaction kinetics, particularly of your supplementary cementitious materials. So the best way to supply extra water is just by having a very small amount of water, which won't change the situation inside the sample. And then, uh, similarly, you can cut slices, as is shown here. But when you're making the analysis, you should always avoid the edges and really look at the central part, because this is likely to be the most homogeneous and the most well cured. Now, why do we need to stop hydration? Well, the real idea of this is to remove the free water while preserving the microstructure. And of course, at early hydration times, for example, if you look, want to look at what is going on through that main heat evolution peak, you need it to stop the further progress of hydration. When you have longer times, so for example, one month, it's not really necessary, but some techniques you may need to remove uh, free water, such as SEM. Um, and in other cases where even though you don't need to remove the water, it may be a good way of minimizing the amount of carbonation. So there's many, many methods which have been discussed in the literature. The most popular and actually the worst, and if there's one thing you really retain from these lectures, it's really don't prepare your samples by drying in an oven. It's the worst technique to use. But for these direct drying techniques, uh, there are lots of different conditions that can be varied, the temperature, the duration, etc. Most of all, the sample size. And the sample size is very important. And this is why we tend to focus on these quite uh, thin slices here, because then these thin slices, we can quite rapidly uh, stop the hydration by either one of these direct drying techniques or by uh, solvent exchange techniques. And these are the methods really I would tend to uh, recommend from practicality. Um, and particularly isopropanol is probably uh, the most strongly recommended, although acetone is also a very good technique. Methanol we tend not to use because it's been claimed to cause health problems. And the problem of ethanol is that ethanol often picks up a lot of water. So it's not really effective in stopping the hydration. And you can look in the literature many, many details of these studies. Now, the problem is that nearly all these methods do produce some change to be aware of what these changes can be. And here I just show one example. There are many more you can look at in the book. And this shows with the x-ray diffraction uh, pattern that it's really mostly the ettringite 
and the AFM phases that are most effective. So here we see a slice without any stopping, and we can see this very nice ettringite peak here. This is generally uh, much lower, and for example, here we've got vacuum drying only for one day, but you see the ettringite has been completely destroyed. Uh, we will also have changes in these phases, the hemi and monocarbo illuminate. This, of course, can also be affected by small quantities of CO2 in the air. And that's another important thing. Really try to protect your samples as much as possible from CO2, storing in a desiccator with a, kind, with a product that absorbs CO2 is the best way to do that. So for X-ray diffraction, as we'll talk about later, then the best method is not to stop at all. But of course, this does depend on having a machine available so you can cut your slice, take it straight to the diffractometer, and make your measurement really without any delay. So the best method for stopping really depends on what you want to do afterwards. If you want to do X-ray diffraction, it's best to measure undried samples. If you're more interested in SEM, as we'll see later, both solvent exchange and freeze drying work well. Interested in mercury intrusion pore symmetry, then solvent exchange is by far the best, as we'll see later. But, and I stress again, please, please, please do not dry your samples at 105 degrees C. You complete microstructure, you completely change the porosity. It's really a bad, bad method. So to finish this first part, we're going to look briefly at an x-ray diffraction. And again, I stress what the material I can cover here is really only a very small of everything you need to. But hopefully you can get some idea. Now, x-ray diffraction is really the pre-technique for looking at uh, crystalline phases. The challenge we have with cement is we have a huge amount of peak overlap. And this is not really surprising because in cement, all the, we're dealing with a quite small number of elements, always things like calcium and silicon and aluminum with oxygen. So the bond distances will always be the same, and this means that the uh, lattice spacings also tend to be very similar. And this is why we get this incredible amount of peak overlap, particularly in this area here for the anhydrous phases. Everything is coming in very, very similar positions. So the detailed quantification, really, this has been a breakthrough in recent years, this development of this Rietveld analysis, but it really has to be applied by an expert to get the best results. Nevertheless, if you do this properly, X-ray diffraction is by far away the most accurate technique for looking at the amount of anhydrous phases, and from that you can calculate the degree of hydration. It's also very good for looking at Portlandite if you're careful to avoid preferential orientation, but TGA is also good for that, and Ettringite. And of course, we can look at the total amorphous if we use a standard. So the apparatus in X-ray diffraction is nowadays almost universally the diffractometer, which has replaced all other techniques which are based on photos, etc. And the idea of this diffractometer is we have a disc of cement paste, which is usually spinning, and then the uh, X-ray source and the detector move um, at the same angle, so we get um, the, the, the X-rays which are uh, diffracted at a given angle can be captured by the detector. And the idea of this technique is that we have a powder, a powder has lots of different crystals in different orientations, and this would give, uh, on a sort of photograph, this would give rings, but by this diffractometer setup, we compress this data into one dimension. So, some practical guidelines. First of all, um, it's important to minimize the particle size. And this particularly can be important if you want to quantify the amorphous phase. So there's been a lot of debate uh, about whether we have amorphous phases in unhydrated cement. And here we can see some results by a paper by Snellings and myself that if you reduce the particle size enough, then you see really there is no amorphous state. But be careful, because if you're going to dry your sample, 
uh, grind your sample dry, then you can actually produce amorphous phases. So you have to do wet grinding, but of course not with water. Again, use something like oh, uh, isopropanol. So this is the kind of sample. Um, traditionally, people use what's called a front loading technique. That's to say you put your powder into the sample holder and then you smooth it off. The problem is that this really tends to produce preferential orientation. If you have crystals which are platy or, or long phases like this, they tend to be oriented and this can make a very, very um, strong impact on the intensity of the peak. So the recommendation is either to use what's called backloading, which is where you put your sample holder on a flat plate and then load the powder from the back, or to use uh, slices, as we've talked about before. And in the slices, when you're hydrating, okay, you haven't ground to maybe to the ideal particle size, but most of the crystals uh, form in very small crystallites at any rate, so you can get quite good uh, results. And here we can see uh, the uh, uh, impact of the different loading techniques in terms of this preferential orientation. You see the back loading, we have uh, the best uh, situation here. The second point, as we've already mentioned, is the stoppage of hydration. Uh, Etriite is the most effective phase. We can see over here a series of different techniques. Um, Generally, for preserving the monocarbonate and the etringite, these first two of the slice are the best. But if you have a slice and you don't do any uh, sort of rough polishing, then you can have a bad impact on your Portlandite. So the technique really we recommend is these fresh slices with just a light amount of polishing on an emery paper. And this slide here just summarizes the diff most popular preparation techniques of fresh slice, um, fre sorry, fresh mix, where you can look at the hydration in situ uh, of a slice or a powder. Now, this method of the Rietveld analysis is extremely powerful and really has made a revolution in the past few decades in the analysis of cements because of this problem of peak, o peak overlap. Now, the idea for this analysis was um, came, Mr. Uh, Professor Rietveld came up with this in 1969 uh, for neutron dis, uh, diffraction. And the idea is you have a calculated pattern, you have an observed pattern, and you minimize the difference by a least squares method. So this is quite easy in terms of the principle, but in terms of the application, because you have many, many techniques, and you have to minimize individually for each of these peaks, then uh, it's really only become practical since the, since the advent of fast personal computers. And this has really made a revolution. And since the turn of the century, this is now more and more implanted in cement plants and really is starting to completely replace the bow calculation for the phases in cement paste, which is really completely inaccurate. Now, if we look in more detail at these uh, peaks, there are many, many different things that can impact the height of the peaks. And of course, these all have to be calculated in these Rietveld analysis. So the peak positions, first of all, are determined by the size and symmetry of the unit cell. The intensities are determined by the position of the atoms, the motif. And then the width can also be affected by many different aspects, the size of the crystallites, the um, configuration of the equipment, etc. And this all leads to this very complicated equation with many, many different variables. Um, and these, all these variables can be refined. And this is the problem. And this is why you need a certain amount of expertise to apply the technique. Because if you let all these variables vary at will, then you can end up with any old rubbish. What we're trying to find here is what's called the scale factor, which is basically how much of the phase we have in the mixture. And all of these parameters here, either we know or we can let them vary uh, within well-defined limits. So just one of these, the structure factor here, for example, this is not the end of the story because this structure factor itself is then the sum of the uh, atomistic scattering factors and then the positions in the unit cell. So this, is, you can see, adds even more variables to the equation.
So we haven't got time to really go into the full detail of how you can do a refinement. Um, it, it's, it's summarized here in this very, very simple equation that you're trying to minimize the uh, least squares between these two patterns, but you have to do that over all the different peaks with all the different variables. So just some small tips, but of course you have to really look at this in more detail if you want to do it yourself. It's really important to start with good literature structure models, a good database. It's really important to minimize the number of defined variables because if you let everything vary, you could end up with any old rubbish. The final refinement should include, or you should really say, all the parameters that have been varied. And in quantitative phase analysis, usually what we do, we refine only the scale factors and the lattice parameters. So we allow the lattice parameters to adjust a bit in case there's been a slight shift in the peaks due to solid solution or something like that. And of course, the scale factor, we have to vary because that's the thing we're trying to find. But even these lattice parameters, we have to constrain the variation within a sensible uh, interval. And then it's important to check the fit and to check that fit visually. Don't just rely on numerical parameters. Have a look at the pattern. Have a look if the peaks are in the right place and things like that. And check these uh, limits of the variation. The other aspect that's important to mention is the, um, the reference weight. So when we're trying to calculate something like degree of hydration, we have to be aware that at the beginning we have a sample with free water, which is usually removed, and then the anhydrous cement. But as the hydration is going on, more and more of that free water is combined in the hydrates, which means the analysis, the weight of stuff we're analyzing, has increased here to here. And we have to take this into account, otherwise we don't, ha we don't have everything normalized to the same amount. And we generally do that by making in parallel a thermogravimetric analysis to analyze the amount of bound water. And if we do that, we can have uh, equations which can convert everything to the uh, ignited basis. And if we do that, whether we do fresh samples or dried samples, we can get very similar uh, values. So here we just see how we can look at the hydration reaction by stacking up uh, lots of different patterns. You can see here, for example, here how the calcium hydroxide is evolving. Um, usually it's more useful to look in this kind of format where we've compressed this data uh, into the evolution of certain phases uh, with time. And this can really be very, very powerful technique for looking at the hydration kinetics. If we want to look at amorphous phase, we have various approaches. The most important are the standard techniques, either internal standard or external standard. Internal standard has the advantage that the standard pattern and the unknown pattern are, correct, are collected under exactly the same conditions. The problem is, if you want to look at a hydrated sample, you should, must not put your standard in when you do your mixing because your standard can, through the filler effect we'll talk about tomorrow, can impact the uh, hydration itself. And for this reason, when you want to look at fresh slices, which is the most practical way of doing things, then this external standard approach is much better. But the important thing here, you have to really measure your external standard and your uh, reference sample under the same conditions at more or less the same time. If you're doing a batch of measurements of say 10 samples, then for every 10 sample you measure your standard sample. Because the x-ray intensity from a standard diffractometer is continuously decreasing over time. Nowadays there's a lot of discussion about this technique called the Ponx method. This means pat pat pattern of no known crystal structure. And this can work quite well for anhydrous phases to discover the, the amount of slag in, a, in an anhydrous cement or the amount of fly ash. But when you have hydration, it, it's not all that good for differentiating, differentiating, for example, between calcium silicate hydrate and slag. So that was, you know, very
overview of uh, the techniques and also a rapid um, introduction to x-ray diffraction.